All right, so we're going to get into the Word, so let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. We're so excited for an opportunity to gather to see your precious people in mass, but glory to God, they are alive, they are, they are breathing, they are walking, they are, they are hugging us virtually, Lord. We're just so grateful. I just pray for the unction of the Spirit right now. Your Word says that your grace is sufficient for us and that in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. So just strengthen me right now to bring the Word in the way you desire. Thank you for the utterance of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for speaking boldly the oracles of God. Thank you. The Word is healing. The Word is life. The Word is comfort. The Word brings correction where it needs to, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for eyes to see and behold wondrous things from your Word, for ears to hear the voice, not of a man, but of the Holy Spirit. And for your heart, Father God, to be for people's hearts to be receptive to your heart, to receive that Word, that your Word will accomplish all that you desire. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you. The word brings healing in Jesus' name. It brings comfort. It brings encouragement. It brings correction in the name of Jesus. So we give you praise. We give you glory in advance in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, most of you know we've been doing the, the series on understanding the end times. And this particular series, as you know, at the beginning of the year, I sort of started off a series concerning the end times. And um, obviously the pandemic hits on, in March, and so I just felt prompted to go back to that, and, and, and it's really for us to understand the end times. Because honestly, a lot of people were taken by surprise. We were all taken by surprise. Governments were taken by surprise. Uh, prophets were taken by surprise as well. Of, of course, God did reveal it to some prophets, but a lot of people were taken by surprise. The church was taken by surprise. You know, but praise God, He wants us to understand the times and the seasons we're in. So we've been looking at that over the past few months and, and, and that we've been in lockdown. I, I feel the urge to continue. I, I, one day I woke up and there was a, the Lord spoke a clear word to me. He said, I want you to blow the trumpets and, to, uh, and, uh, and sound the alarm. I'm coming soon. I heard it. In fact, the way it came, he said, the, the voice said, alarm force. I said, what's alarm force? And the Lord said, I want you to blow the trumpet. I want you to sound the alarm. He is coming soon. And as you, most of you know, that scripture is from the book of Joel. But anyway, uh, so that's why I feel so um, stirred in my heart to bring this word to God's people. I want you to have ears to hear because Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Turn to somebody in your family and say, Jesus is coming soon. Amen. God has forewarned us through in the, both the Old Testament and the New Testament of the end times. He has told us what's going to happen. The reason he has done that is because he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He sees the end from the beginning. And he, 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 as he has warned us, he has told us that certain difficult things are going to happen. Certain traumatic, chaotic things are going to happen in the world before Christ comes again. He has not shared this to scare us. He has not shared this to make us afraid. He has not shared us to make us uh, dismayed or uh, perturbed in any way. No, no, no. God has shared all of these truths so that he will encourage us, so that he will comfort us, so that he will let us know ahead of time that he is in control. Because he, he tells us ahead of time, you know, they say to be forewarned is to be forearmed. He wants us not only to, to be aware of it, but to thrive in these situations. He wants us also to be prepared. Because when you know what's coming, you're prepared. A lot of us, a lot of people were not prepared for the pandemic, so there was a rush on toilet paper. <laughs> I think an unnecessary rush on toilet paper, amen. But the point I'm making is that people were suddenly not prepared, so people began to stockpile and all that kind of stuff. But when you, you know something is coming, ahead of time, you prepare yourself, right? Ahead of time, you're looking to make sure that you have everything you need. And in the same way, God has forewarned us to prepare His church how we should live, how we should live with confidence, how we should live with confidence even though the world may be very fearful and, and may not know what to happen, how we should live with, with um, confidence even though the world is, 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 is in a place of fear, a place of trepidation, you know. It's important to know the times because if you miss the times and, this, and you don't understand the times, you can miss out on the purpose of God. And we know from the Bible in the, in the New Testament that the, the Pharisees missed out on the purpose of God. Unfortunately, they missed out on the purpose of God. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 3, that you know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. You don't know how to interpret the science of the times. What happened to the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They missed out on Messiah. Messiah was in their midst. And yet, 
What happened? They missed out on Messiah. They crucified Messiah. They did not understand the times and the seasons. Can somebody say amen? Man, it's good to hear the amen. It's good to hear the amen. Usually I say amen um, on the camera, but glory to God, there's amen back. Amen. So you and I need to understand the times and the seasons. Jesus is coming back soon. I don't know if you understand that. If you understand he's coming back soon, then your lifestyle will be lived in such a way that you are awaiting his coming. You can't say Jesus is coming back soon and then do everything like he's not coming back soon. You can't say Jesus is coming back soon and not try to live your life in a faithful way to glorify God. Jesus is coming back soon. I want to ask you a few questions. Are you ready for his coming? Are you living for a purpose? Ephesians chapter 5, 15 tells us, be careful. Okay, be careful. In other words, be cautious. Be vigilant how you live. Don't live anyhow. It says be careful. Then verse, it goes on and says, don't live like fools. In other words, it's possible to live like a fool. It's possible to live like somebody who doesn't have any understanding. It's possible. And you know what? A lot in the church are living that way, as if they have no inkling of what is happening. But the, but the Scripture, Holy Spirit is saying, don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise, those who have understanding. He goes on, make the most of every opportunity in these last evil days. The days are evil. That one I think people get, okay? And the Bible is telling us that in these evil days, these dark days, in these terrible days, you got to make, take advantage of every opportunity. You have to take advantage of it. You know, a lot of people don't take advantage of the opportunities that come their way. For example, there's opportunity to get into the Word and study the Word. But people don't take advantage of it. There's opportunity to gather as God's people to pray. People don't take advantage of it. There's opportunity to share your faith with somebody, to pray for somebody, to be the witness wherever you are. But people are not taking advantage of it. The Bible tells us here, make the most of every opportunity. Every opportunity. Amen. And then it says, don't act thoughtlessly, without thinking. Don't act without thought, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. You have to understand what God wants you to do. Now, you may not know specifically if God wants you to be an engineer or a doctor. God has called you to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. So even if you don't know the broad, the, you know, the, the specific destiny in terms of what your purpose is in, in, the, in the country, just know that if you are living for Christ, that is one thing that you are called to do. Amen. And it says, make sure you understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. You and I are called to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh. So both in the Old and New Testament, you know, God has given us these signs of the end, and He wants us to understand the signs of the end. You know, and, and I, as you know, we, the signs are in two, in six different categories. There's societal signs, environmental, natural signs, there's religious signs, political signs, uh, technological signs, and even signs concerning the nation of Israel. Israel is a main major, major sign in these end times, and specifically Jerusalem. I'm telling you, when, when um, the, 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 the Israel became a nation again in 1948, that was a powerful sign, powerful sign in Bible prophecy, because everybody thought that Israel would never come back together again. So in fact, scholars, biblical scholars, you know, uh, they thought that, you know what, the church had replaced Israel. Because for years, you know, several years, Israel was dispersed all over the world. But in 1948, God fulfilled his word in the book of Ezekiel. Glory to God. And it became a nation again. And then when they took Jerusalem in the 1967, that was also another powerful sign. But anyway, I go ahead of my time. My, my, I'm going ahead of myself. So these are all signs that God has given. We have looked at some of the societal signs, you know, we, that Jesus spoke of, like deception. I'm not going to go over that. If you need, you need to go back on, into our archives, the, you know, we talked about deception. We've looked at different characteristics in our society that the Holy Spirit talks about. So when you see these things happening, you should know in your heart, we're in the end times. We're in the end times. We're in the end times. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5, it tells us that in the end times, society is going to become increasingly ungodly. Society is going to become increasingly wicked. 
wicked. In fact, in the book of, uh, of uh, Isaiah, he prophesies that in the end times, people will say the things that are right are wrong. The things that are wrong are right. They'll say the things that are, are light are re- is really darkness. They will just swap. Everything will be upside down. And people will think it's okay. People will think it's okay. So he has warned us. So let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. It says, Know this, that in the last days, um, that means at the very end, perilous, that's difficult, terrible, dangerous times will come. It says, for men will be lovers of themselves. We've looked at that a few uh, months ago. You know, that is people will be, uh, they'll have self-love. They'll be self-absorbed. Everything will be about me, 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 me. It says lovers of money. People are going to be covetous. Money is going to be a real God. People are going to be boasters. People are going to be committed to self-promotion and personal. They'll have their own personal agenda. They will exaggerate. You know, they will like to puff up themselves. And people are going to be proud. People are going to feel superior to others, you know, and and, 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 and people will feel elitist. You know, these are all signs of the end. People are going to be blasphemous. They're going to be profane. Yeah, they're going to have unclean language. Isn't that true? Isn't that true today? People are going to be uh, disobedient to parents. You know, kids are going to be disobedient to parents. They're going to be unpersuadable, you know, uncontrollable. They're no longer, um, parents are going to find it difficult to exercise authority over their children. I remember... Several years ago, I'm not going to tell you which child, but I was beginning to, I was going, I was going to discipline my, one of my children and said, I'll call the police. I said, go ahead and call the police. But what I'm trying to say is that the society now is going to be such that um, uh, people are going to find it difficult to discipline their children. People are going to be unthankful. People are going to feel entitled. And so many of us feel entitled. People are going to be unholy. We looked at that a few weeks ago. And today we're going to look at unloving. People are going to be unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control. People are going to be brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. And then the, the Holy Spirit says, and from such, turn away. Have nothing to do with that. So God has warned us when you see these things happening He has warned us. When you see these things happening, he's saying it's going to happen. So you know, this is a fulfillment of of, of God's prophecy. When it happens, you have to be wet because he says, the wrath of God is coming against those things. Make no mistake about it. During the seven-year tribulation period, God's wrath is coming against wickedness and ungodliness. That's why you have to get yourself ready. Amen. So we're going to look at the fact that God says that in the last days, people are going to be unloving. Now, I want to make this statement. All these traits have been in society for years. But the the reason why it's critical now is because it's saying that there's going to be such an increase. You're going to be immersed in it in such a way that it's it's going to be the common feature. For example, Jesus spoke about earthquakes and and wars. We've always had earthquakes. You've always had wars. But he said it's going to be like a woman in in birth pangs. It's going to be like a woman in labor. You know, I haven't had any experience uh, in labor, glory to God. But I have watched somebody in labor. And what tends to happen is that the contractions, you know, they get more frequent as the time gets near for the baby to come. As it gets time for the, for the mother to push, the contractions are closer and closer and closer. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's going to be like the birth pangs. It's going to be like a woman in labor. You're going to see an intensity of earthquakes, an intensity of wars, rumors of wars, and, and all these things. You're going to see such an intensity of what is happening in society. It'll be, you can't take your eyes off it. You put on the TV, you're going to see that. People are boasters. People are, 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 are blasphemous. You're going to see it. And it's now in, in comedies. It's now everywhere. So that's what it's trying to say. It's going to, and the Bible is saying that people are going to be unloving. Unloving. Now, in the, the King James Version, it says people are going to be without natural affection, without natural affection. And I believe the, way, the only way to really understand that is to get into the Greek words for without natural affection. So most translations say unloving. The King James says without natural affection. I think that is the one that we really want to look at because the Greek word for without natural affection or unloving here is the Greek word 
astogos, astogos. And this Greek word is from another Greek word, stogos, okay? And that word stogos is devotion and commitment to one's family. It's devotion, commitment to one's family. So when you put the A in front of stogos, it becomes a negative. So it means it's a lack of devotion to family, a lack of commitment to family. It means a loss of family affection. It means people are going to be heartless concerning relatives, concerning family. People are going to be hard-hearted towards their kindred, towards their family and, re and family relations. People are going to be without natural affection. So what it's really telling us is that in the last days, love and commitment to family will deteriorate in the church Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, will deteriorate and crumble in the society. That's what's going to happen. It's going to deteriorate. You're going to see that families are going to break up. Families are going to have discord. There's going to be disunity. There's going to be divisions. That's why it says the natural love and affection meant for family, it will not be the priority. And really, the reason is because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, that people are going to be lovers of themselves. People are going to be focused on themselves. What they want. And as a result, they will not think the priority of the love for the family is a priority. So Bible is telling us that there will be a breakdown in the family and in the home in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves more than their family. You see, if God is the number one, you will do everything to please God. And so obviously, if you are in a family, you will do everything that God wants you to do as a, as a family unit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Help me out a little bit. Say amen. Okay, so there's there so many reasons for, for that, and, and I don't want to go into all the sociological reasons in terms of people are so busy and, and uh, people don't meet together any longer, people have different TVs, you know, so there's no family time. I don't want to go into all of that, but essentially what it is is that people are lovers of themselves, it's about me, what I want, it's my agenda, it's my interest, not the interest of the family. Not the interest of the children, not in the interest of the wife or the husband, not in the interest of the brothers and the sisters. It's what is my interest. So that is the driving force. The statistics show that the trends in family life are troubling. It shows it. High rates of divorce, high teenage pregnancies. You know, there's such an increase in, in, in domestic violence, domestic abuse. You know, the WHO in 2017 gave some terrifi terrifying statistic. About 30% of women who have been in a relationship, you know, they report that they have, been, um, they have been abused sexually or physically. Think about that, 30%. And 38% of murders of women is by somebody who they know, who they have lived with. That is unloving, without natural affection. It's troubling. But unfortunately, this is also in the church. Unfortunately, it's in the church. You know, many have abandoned biblical principles and instructions. Many in the church have abandoned biblical instructions and precepts and commands of God. You see, God designed the family. So he shows us how to live in the family. But a lot of us have abandoned that. You know, and a lot of people now think that some of the precepts in the scriptures are outdated. But they're not outdated. Amen? The Bible tells in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And now a lot of times, parents don't see why they should obey their parents. Children don't see why they should obey their parents. They don't. You know? And then it says, Honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother is what God says. And that's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. As you know, this was also from the Old Testament. But it's a New Testament precept as well. And it goes on and says, which is the first commandment with a promise. So of all the promises of God, this one is, there's a promise attached for your benefit when you honor your father and your mother. When you are the, notice what it says, that it may be well with you. That it may be well with you. How many of you want it to be well with you? How many, and it goes on and says, that, and, and you may live long on the earth. When you honor your father and mother, mother, the Bible says it to be well with you, and you have a long life. And yet many people, including people in the church, do not honor their father and mother. And they give all sorts of excuses why they will not honor their father and their mother. But the scripture is saying here, honor them. Honor them. 
Then Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives. That word love is the word agape, the God kind of love, the unconditional love. Love your wives. And it gives us a, a very difficult standard to go by. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. In other words, just like Christ was willing to die for the church, husbands, you are supposed to be willing to die for your wives. A few women said amen. But that's what the Bible says. And yet many men will not tolerate a lot from their wives, let alone die for them. But that's what the Bible tells us. Amen. And then it says, Ephesians 5, 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands. as to the Lord. Ask to the Lord. Just like you submit to the Lord, submit to your husbands. Amen. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And yet, again, in our culture, this is not, it's considered outdated. Ephesians chapter four, 6 verse 4 is another powerful scripture. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. We're going to read it in a second when I get this back on. <laughs> Man, there's so many issues today. There we go. Okay. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. This applies to mothers as well. Don't ex exasperate your children. Don't let them stress out. That's what the Bible is saying. Don't provoke them to anger in the way you treat them. This is a serious thing for parents. And he says, rather bring them up with the discipline instruction that comes from the Lord. If when it comes from the Lord, guess what? It means that it has to be in love. We're talking about the society being without natural affection. And this is really focused on the family. And what I'm trying to show you is that this, God has given us the patterns. He's given us the precepts. But a lot of us don't follow those precepts. So as a result, we are walking in, in that unloving state. Okay, is it any wonder that the, the, the family unit, as God designed it, is under so much stress right now, even in the church? It's because we're not following God's instruction. Folks, we're in the last days, and people will be unloving. But even though this scripture refers specifically to the family and to relations in the family, it also speaks about people being unloving in society. Because there's so many other parallel scriptures that talk about the, the, the society being unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, and all those kind of things. For example, if you look at the book of Romans chapter 131, it talks about what the society will look like. How they'll be ungrateful, they will not consider God, and so God will give them up. And as a result of that, they'll, they'll be, God will say, okay, do what you want to do. And then people, you know, it's a, you want to read Romans chapter 1 from verse 1 to 31. But it talks about how society will look like. People will be despisers of good. People will hate what is good. It goes through a whole list. And in that list, in verse 31, it says people will be unloving, people will be unforgiving, people will be unmerciful. So it's not just in the church. It's also in society. And you see it all around. You see it on Facebook and on Twitter. You see it. Jesus spoke about it. Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 24, 12 to 13, when on the Oliver's discourse, when he spoke about the signs of the end. He said in verse 12, he says, because lawlessness will abound, that is because sin will become so rampant around, the love of many will grow cold. The love of many. Notice he says, many, which means a lot of people's love is going to grow cold. And he says this, but... He who endures to the end shall be saved. The condition is that you've got to endure to the end. Now that word love, I think here he's talking about the church, unfortunately. When he says the love of many will grow cold. Why do I say that? Because that word love is not the common word that is used for society like filial love or eros, which is sexual love, but filial love in terms of friendship and affection amongst friends or storge, which is the love for 
for a parent for, to, towards a child. The word uses the word agape, the God kind of love that has been shared abroad in our hearts. So I believe he's talking to believers here. And he says the love, the love of many will grow cold. The love will go cold towards God, and as a result, it will go cold towards people. It will grow cold towards one another because our love is cold towards God. That agape love is the love he has shed abroad in our hearts. It's going to grow cold. It's going to grow cold. Remember the church of Laodicea. He said, I would you were hot or cold, but you are lukewarm. Lukewarm is not hot. Some people are going to be lukewarm. Some people are going to be cold. And that's what he's saying. Jesus is saying about the last days. The love of many would grow cold towards Christ, towards God, towards the things of God. And the love of many will grow cold towards people. People in their family, people, their neighbors, people of different races. And we see that. We see that. Jesus tells us why. He says, because of the increase in sin and wickedness in society. Because of the increase in sin, it says, because of lawlessness. There's going to be so much wickedness in society. And as a result, the church is going to be affected and people's love is going to go cold. You know? Unfortunately, a lot of Christians, our love has diminished. And you know whether you love God or not if you keep his commandments. That's the test. That's the Lisbeth's test. Jesus said it very clearly. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He said, if you love me, you will love one another. That's It's simple. Are you keeping the commandments of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you walking in love? That is the test, folks. And I'm talking about the unconditional agape coin, kind of love, which is patient, which is kind, which does not insist on its own way. I knew it was going to get quieter and quieter in here. But I'm preaching the truth, God, folks. I'm preaching the word of God. Many people's love will grow cold. That unconditional kind of love you have in your community, with your siblings or with your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, is going to become cold because our love for God is cold. You see, you can't say you love people if you don't love. You can't say you love God if you don't love people because God has said that if you say you love people and you don't love, if you say you love God and you don't love people, then you are lying. He says, if you say that you love God, oh, I love God, but you don't love people, you're lying. I also say this, if you say you love God and you don't keep his commandments, you are lying. You're lying. 1 John chapter 4, verse um, 20. I'll start from verse 20. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people, we can see how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. We have to love one another. Amen. So I want to ask you, has your love grown cold? Has your love for God grown cold? Are you loving others with the agape kind of love? Has your love grown cold? Another reason Jesus gives for our people's love growing cold is the sin of offense. And this is another subtle sin, but the sin of offense. And unfortunately, it's very much alive in the church today. Offense, where people have, have slighted you, people have insulted you, or people have grieved you, have done something wrong against you, and then you hold it against them. Jesus prophesied that many in the last days will be offended. He said many will betray one another. Many will hate one another. Matthew 24, 10. It says that many, notice that word again, many, not a few people, many will be offended. They will betray one another, will hate one another. And that word many means, it means that many, it means a lot of people are going to feel offended. They're going to feel slighted. They're going to feel mistreated by others. A lot of people are going to, and that is very true. You know, people are going to feel resentment and bitterness. People are going to be unforgiving as a result of that. Many people are going to betray one another. When people hold stuff in confidence, you, you freely share it to make somebody else look bad. We see it even in our political discourse where people, you know, they are sworn to secrecy through some act of parliament or congress or whatever. And then they, as soon as they get out, they go to the lawyers and they come out of the book and spill the beans, and they betray one another. 
But that's what the Bible is saying here. That people are going to betray one another. And unfortunately, people are going to hate. And unfortunately, people do hate others. Sometimes because of race. We see it play in front of us on our screens, television screens. But people hate. And Jesus said, it's going to be like that in the last days. But why would people get to this point? Because of offense. Because of unforgiveness. Notice the progression. Jesus says people are going to be offended. That's the first stage. People are going to be mistreated, insulted, feel slighted, you know, feel wronged. And then they'll, they'll betray one another. That's the next step. And then they will hate one another. I pray to God that you are not walking in offense. I pray to God that you are not betraying other people or that you hate other people because of race, because of tribe, or because of gender. There's no reason to hate. I said there's no reason to hate. We are called to love with the God kind of love. The way he loved us, that's how we are called to love. Can I hear amen? Now, it's particularly important that you and I walk without offense. You know, offense, Jesus says offense is going to come. Okay, but he says, woe to those that, to whom it comes. So, there's a, so you have to guard your heart concerning on offense. You have to release people. Folks, I know this is not easy. I've had to release people as well. I've had to do that. Sometimes it's more difficult for other people because of the, grief, the, 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 the extent to which they have been abused. Maybe as a child or or somebody has broken your heart or whatever. So I'm not trying to downplay it, but I'm here to tell you that the thing about offense is that it is a snare from the devil that affects you. It's like drinking a poison. Unforgiveness is like a poison. Forgiving those who have offended you benefits you more than it does them. So you have to make sure you're free from offense. You see, unforgiveness leads to bitterness. And bitterness is that poison that, that takes root inside of you. And it affects you negatively. And it affects others around you. That's why you've got to release it. Aside from the fact that God is grieved when we walk in unforgiveness. He says, forgive us you know, for our trespasses as we forgive others. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. I'm putting this to, bringing this to a close now. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous roots of bitterness. Be careful, be vigilant that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you or to torment you, corrupting many. What it's telling us is that Bitterness is like a poison that takes root and it brings you trouble. Jesus gave a very stark parable about somebody walking in unforgiveness and how it opened the door for the tormentors. Folks, it's in your interest to let go of, of offense. It's in your, for your interest to forgive. Now, am I saying it's easy? No. But that's why we have the help of who is the Holy Spirit. You have to release them by faith and say, Father, and in fact, sometimes you have to even grit your teeth and say, Father, bless them. Father, bless them. The reason you say that is because the Bible says, bless your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. Folks, those were the words of Jesus. I'm not making this thing up. But that's what you have to do. And by faith, if it means every single day you are saying, Lord, I release them, do that. God sees your heart. And with time, he'll give you the healing balm of Gilead to heal you. But you cannot afford to walk in offense. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. That person who has grieved you or that person who has, uh, has mistreated you, you know, don't give them the, the power through your offense for them to affect, the offense to affect you and to affect those around you. The Bible is saying, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you and corrupting many. So the poison of offense is, 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 comes from that bitterness and it affects you and it affects other people as well. Amen. So how do I want to end this? I want to end this with a prayer that Paul prayed for the people. In Philippi. And before I pray this prayer, I want to ask you a few questions. Have you been offended by someone to the extent where you are now resentful? You're bitter because of that offense. 
I know that a lot of us have. When you, bring, when you do an altar call for unforgiveness, almost everybody in the church comes forward. So I know. Okay? Are you unloving? In every, every time the Bible is describing a society, it talks of unloving. Immediately after that, it says unforgiving. You see that in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You see that in, in Romans chapter 1, 3. It talks about being unloving, being unforgiving. They are tied together. If that's your situation, with the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm asking you in these last days to repent. Change your mind, change your, your actions based on what you know God's Word says and say to God honestly, Father, I can't do this in my own strength. Holy Spirit, I can't do this in my own strength. Help me. But the truth of the matter is you cannot afford to walk in offense in these last days because that bitterness will lead to something negative in your life and will affect others. It will trouble you. You are the one that's going to be tormented. You've got to leave it to God. You've got to say, Lord, it's difficult, but I, 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 just, I just cast it on you. Help me to forgive. Help me to forgive. Help me to forgive. You've got to ask God for help. Don't open the door for torment and trouble. Don't attract, let, give the devil an opportunity to come into your life and the life of your home. Because you, he will. He will. You've got to walk in unforgiveness. You've got to forgive the person who has offended you. You've got to ask God for help. Holy Spirit for help. Because he loves you. And he wants the best for you. Amen. I said he loves you. And he wants the best for you. In the last days, people are going to be unloving. Paul prayed for the Philippians in First Peter, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. He says, I pray that your love may abound, may grow, may increase more and more in knowledge and all discernment or all understanding. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense without offense, till the day of Christ. You see, the Bible says that love, the God kind of love, agape love, it covers a multitude of sins. It covers a what? Multitude of sins. That's the agape kind of love. And so when our love increases more and more, when God's love increases more and more, the love He has shed abroad in our heart, when we yield to it more and more, and by faith walk in that love, what it does is that it removes us from offense. So Paul said, I'll just read it again. I pray that your love may abound still more and more. And then verse 10, that you may, you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. The day of Christ is drawing near, folks. I don't want Jesus to find me in a place of offense. Do you want him to find you in a place of offense? I don't want Jesus to find me in a place where I'm unloving towards the people in my family. Do you want him to find you in that place? No. I want him to see me walking in love. I want him to see me, I mean, I want him to see me loving him. And the, the, the fruit of that is the fact that I love other people and I'm obedient to his word. That's how I want him to see me. I want to be ready when he returns. Do you want to be ready? Do you want to be ready? Amen. So we're going to say a quick prayer right now. I just want you to reflect a few moments. Just a few moments. I know God has spoken to you. What did he challenge you on in this sermon? Is there someone or are there people that you need to release, that you need to forgive? I want you to just spend a few moments with the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, help me. Say, 
Holy Spirit, help me. Say, Holy Spirit, help me. Is it a sister, a brother? Is it a son? Is it a mother, a father? Is it a daughter? Is it a husband? Is it a wife? Is it an in-law? Or a manager in your life? A colleague? Somebody who was an authority that abused that authority when you were young. Oh, let this be the moment where you say, Lord, help me to release them. Help me to forgive them. Help me to love them. God doesn't expect you to love this, love them with your own strength. No. He doesn't expect you to forgive them in your own strength. No. He expects you to ask for His help. So this moment, just ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. Ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your precious word today. Thank you that you've revealed that in the last days we will notice that our society is unloving. Thank you for your word to us. That in the last days many people's love for you and for others will grow cold. Father, we come before your throne us now at this moment. We confess that in many ways we have been unloving. We have been without natural affection. We have borne grudges and offenses. We have walked in unforgiveness and in resentment. Lord, this hour we're saying we're sorry for grieving you. And Lord, this hour we're saying we repent. Give us the strength to repent, O oh God. Give us the strength to release the people that have offended us, made fun of us, mistreated us, abused us, broken our trust. We release them. By faith, we release them. By faith, we release them to you. Help us not to hold grudges against anyone. Help us to walk in love. Lord, we do not know how to do this in our own strength. So we're asking that we will you help us to love with the love that you have shed abroad in our hearts. The God kind of love that only you can love through us. Holy Spirit, help us. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, we release them and receive your love. Help that love to cover a multitude of sins in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we thank you that we are your beloved people called by your name. Our prayer today is that, Lord, we will be expectant of your return and we will live in anticipation of your turn, your return in the name of Jesus. Stir in our hearts that eagerness for your return. Help us to live each day passionately for you, doing what you've called us to do, understanding that the days are evil and understanding your purpose in these evil days. Help us to take advantage of every opportunity. Oh, Father, help us to see the opportunities around us. Opportunities to be the witness you've called us to be. Opportunities to grow in the things of God. Oh, Father, 
help us. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us not to live our lives foolishly without understanding, but help us to live like those who are wise, those who understand the times and the seasons. Oh God, our desire is that when you return, you say to each one of us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Help us to live for you above everything else, oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for your beloved people gathered here today. I thank you for them, oh God, for sustaining them, for looking over them, for protecting them, for protecting families and their children, husbands and wives and relatives. Thank you that you looked over your word concerning divine protection and your word came to pass in their lives. Thank you for divine provision. Oh God, thank you. We continue to believe you to, to, to hedge in your beloved people. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, river of life, river of life, international fellowship, young or old, babe or elderly. We're asking and we're praying in the name of Jesus, Father, that you shield us in that secret place. Oh God where the enemy cannot come. You are our fortress. You are our stronghold. You are our strong tower. You are our refuge. And we put our trust, our confident reliance in you. So Father, I thank you that you who are the keeper of Israel, you who neither sleep nor slumber, you who are the creator of the heavens and the earth, you keep your beloved at River of Life International Fellowship. You keep them from all harm. You watch over their going out. You watch over their coming in. Oh, we give you praise. We give you praise. I thank you, Father. We give you praise. It's such a joy to gather with your people today, Lord. Holy Spirit, we give you praise. We honor you. We declare that you are good perfect. You are great and greatly to be praised. There is no God like you. So be exalted in Jesus' mighty name. And the beloved together said, Amen.